Hello and welcome. My name is Kalab and today we're diving into one of the coolest processes in development, the formation of the structures that make up your head and neck. Think about it. Everything from your jaw to your middle ear to parts of your throat starts with a transitory structure called the pharyngeal apparatus. It's pretty wild when you realize just how much is happening behind the scenes. Today, we're taking a closer look at the mysterious and fascinating journey of the pharyngeal apparatus. So let's get started. Our story begins in the fourth week of embryonic development. Picture this, I was just a tiny two millimeter long embryo with my head starting to fold forward and expand. Adorable, right? That folding process lays the groundwork for the pharyngeal apparatus to form. At this stage, the embryo has three key layers, the ectoderm on the outside, which will develop into the nervous system, skin, and eyes, the endoderm on the inside, giving rise to the inner linings of organs like the stomach and intestines, and the mesoderm in between, which will form the connective tissue, muscles, and blood vessels. A lot of the literature, cue the groans, don't worry, it's just background, claims that the pharyngeal apparatus differentiation starts with migrating neural crest cells. These ectodermal overachievers, as you might remember, travel all over the embryo to build facial bones, nerves, skin pigment, and even parts of the heart. For a long time, scientists thought these cells were the spark that kicked off the cascade leading to the formation of the pharyngeal apparatus. But plot twist, newer research shows that it's actually the endoderm that gets the ball rolling. Here's how it works. Endodermal cells begin to form little outpockets or pouches, psst, remember that, it'll be important later. On the inside of the embryo, these pouches narrow the gap between the endoderm and ectoderm, carving out semi-distinct regions that set the stage for development. Now you might be wondering, but Kalib, what about all of that space in front of and behind the pharyngeal apparatus? What's it filled with? Good question, my young Padawan. I won't give you the full answer just yet, patience you must have but I will tell you that a big chunk of it is filled with ectodermal cells destined to become our nervous system. By this stage in development, brain formation is already in motion. Mini-Me has proudly developed his primary brain vesicles, the prosencephalon, mesencephalon, and rhomboencephalon, the fancy names for the forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain respectively. Here's the coolest part. Neural crest cells migrate in from the rhomboencephalon, the part of the brain destined to become the hindbrain, and take charge of the next phase. The paths these cells follow are also not that random. They're precisely coordinated to help form the maxillary V2 and mandibular V3 branches of cranial nerve 5, as well as cranial nerves 7, 9, and 10, which will later innervate different head and neck structures. Even more impressive, these neural crest cells direct much of the differentiation within the arches, guiding the development of key structures like cartilage, bones, and connective tissues. Meanwhile, the mesoderm plays its part too. It thickens within each arch to contribute to the muscles and blood vessels, ensuring that the arches aren't just decorated. The ectoderm on the outside also folds inward to form grooves that correspond to endodermal pouches, further defining each arch. Together, these three layers, neural crest cells, mesoderm, and ectoderm, work in harmony to transform the pharyngeal apparatus into the intricate anatomy of the head and neck. By the end of this process, we have four pharyngeal grooves on the outside that are made of ectoderm, four pharyngeal pouches on the inside, which form the endoderm, and six pharyngeal arches in between made of mesoderm and neural crest cells or mesenchymal tissue. If you caught the numbers four, four, six, you might be thinking, wait, what? Here's the deal. While there are technically six pharyngeal arches, the fifth arch doesn't actually form any adult structures and quickly disintegrates. We call that also obliterate. Also, arches four and six are nearly indistinguishable, so we'll treat them as a pair. Now, while I've shown the arches forming at the same time in this animation, they actually form in the craniocaudal sequence. Arch 1 appears on day 22, arches 2 and 3 on day 23, and arches 4 and 6 on day 29. So here's a quick recap. Each arch has a mesenchymal core made of mesoderm and neural crest cells. This core includes a central cartilaginous skeletal element derived from the neural crest cells, striated muscle precursors that come from the mesoderm, and an aortic arch artery. But it's not just about the arches. The grooves, also known as crests, arches, and pouches all play unique and vital roles in shaping the head and neck. Generally speaking, the pouches on the inside will form specialized glands. The groups on the outside primarily form external structures like the external auditory meatus from the first group. Yep, that's all we need to know from there. And the arches do a lot more, but we'll dive into that shortly. Before we go too deep into the details, let's quickly go over our learning objectives for this video. 
First up, we'll describe the components and development of the pharyngeal arches, pouches, and clefts. Wait, didn't we just do that? Rhetorical question, yes, we did. So check. Next, we'll explore the fate of these components and the adult structures they contribute to. This part will get a little bit more detailed, but don't worry, we'll break it down into two main sections. First, we'll examine the fates of each of the pouches, arches, and grooves. Mini-Me and I will guide you through the important structures each of these develops into in a more intuitive way. This section will give you a solid understanding of the adult anatomical derivatives of the pharyngeal apparatus. I'll be honest, I don't love learning from complex diagrams because they can feel overwhelming, but I've included one here for those of you who prefer that style. We'll go over it together and use it as an outline for this section. In the second part, we'll focus on the specific developmental processes of the face, palate, tongue, and thyroid glands. Understanding these processes is crucial because they'll help build the intuition needed for understanding the clinical correlates which we'll sprinkle throughout this video. Here's what we'll cover. Cleft lip and palate, ectopic thyroid tissue, congenital hypothyroidism, thyroglossal duct cysts, branchial fistulas and cysts, DeGeorge syndrome, and Treacher-Collins syndrome. 